Today on From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, he continues his timely series, We Are Soldiers, because in the grueling spiritual battles of life, it's not uncommon for those in the Lord's army to get exhausted. Today, you'll learn what to do when you suffer from battle fatigue. Little boy was in church. He was one of those little guys that had kind of some trouble sitting for long periods of time. Do any parents have any kids like that? You're, that's why we have children's church, but we're glad to have our kids in here and uh, to do once a month big church for our children. But this little guy was in church and the sermon was going long. We don't know what that is, but he, but he understood what that was. And the sermon was going long, and the preacher was really getting into it. And he was he was kind of circling the runway, you know, or, or, or when circling the 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 airport where he's getting ready to land, but he hadn't landed yet. And it's like, when is this thing going to be over? And this is how he uh, ended his message. He said to the congregation, he said, "What do you want God to do for you?" And there was a pause. And then he asked again, what do you want God to do for you? And the pause, and it was quiet. And he asked a third time, a rhetorical question, what do you want God to do for you? And the little boy couldn't stand it anymore, and he blurted out, I want God to let me go home. <laughs> that kid was suffering from sermon fatigue. You people don't know anything about that, but in some churches they have... Sermon fatigue. Well, we're in a series called We Are Soldiers, and we're learning about being a good soldier of Christ Jesus. As Paul told Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And today we want to talk about battle fatigue. Hey, what do you do when you're in the army of the Lord and when you're in the battle, the Lord's, you're fighting the Lord's battles. You know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Paul said, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. We're to put on the full armor of God so we can stand firm against the schemes of the devil. But what do you do when you just get weary in the war, when you get tired in the battle, when you get discouraged because you're praying and things aren't happening and you're, you're believing God and nothing's coming about and you just get, ah, I just feel like quitting. I feel like giving up. I don't know if I can do this anymore. That's called spiritual battle fatigue. And hey, if you have ever felt like that or if you feel like that now, good news, you're not alone. Two of the greatest Old Testament saints, they felt like that. Moses prayed as he led the people of God and as he was in the wilderness for so long, he prayed, God, I can't do this anymore. God, please, if I have found favor in your sight, kill me now. Moses prayed that. Ask God to kill him. Elijah he prayed that in 1 Kings chapter 19. He had defeated the, the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. It was a great victory, but right on the heels of that, Jezebel, the evil queen, she's coming after him, and she said, I'm going to kill you. And so he runs away, and he finds himself under a juniper tree, and he says, Lord, I'm no better than my father's. It is enough, oh Lord, take my life. Now, you got some heavy hitters in Moses and Elijah. Both of them prayed that God would kill them. Why? Because they had battle fatigue. Those are the two guys that appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah. You don't get any, any greater in your usefulness for the Lord than Moses and Elijah, but they had battle fatigue. So if you're here today and you have battle fatigue, you're not alone in this thing called spiritual battle fatigue. Now, in the book of Nehemiah, 
God had commissioned Nehemiah, laid upon his heart as Nehemiah prayed, that he was to go back to Jerusalem. He was the cupbearer to the king in uh, the king of Persia. He was to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Now, if you remember your Bible history, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had come into Jerusalem in 586 B.C. and had broken down the wall and destroyed it and came against the temple of God, Solomon's beautiful temple, and burned it with fire and wrecked it and ruined it and took a bunch of people captive and brought them back to Babylon. And they were in captivity for 70 years. And then at the end of 70 years... Medo-Persia had taken over Babylon, and Cyrus the Great allowed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. And Zerubbabel led about 42,000, 43,000 Jews back to Jerusalem. And what they did when they went back there is they rebuilt the temple. And that took place in 515 B.C., the rebuilt temple. And that was very, very important because that's the heartbeat of Jewish life is the temple where they sacrifice and they worship God. But the walls were still down, and the walls stayed down for 140 years until God put it in Nehemiah's heart. You go back, and you rebuild the wall. And it seemed like a massive task. So he went back. He got the people excited. They're going to rebuild the wall. He's like, man, we're going to do this. This is going to be awesome. It was very important in that day to have a wall around your city so the people would feel safe in the city. So they wouldn't feel like we're sitting ducks for anybody that comes in. You know, it's like having a house that doesn't have doors on it. You wouldn't feel very safe there. And so they needed walls around the city. And Nehemiah got them to rebuild the wall. And they came to the halfway point and they got tired and they got weary and they got fatigued in the work. It says in Nehemiah 4.10, The strength of the burden bearers is failing, yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. It's like signing up to say, hey, I'm going to climb Mount Everest. You get all jazzed about doing that, and then you get halfway up the mountain, and you're like, and there's there's more mountain here, and I don't think I'm going to be able to do it. And our strength has failed. Battle fatigue. Hey, what do you do? when you're experiencing battle fatigue? Well, what does God have to tell us? Well, he, in Nehemiah chapter four, he gives us four reasons why we get battle fatigue, why we get so discouraged and why we uh, tend to want to throw in the towel. Four reasons why and why we come to that place and then how we overcome in that experience. First of all, battle fatigue comes when we listen to lies. Nehemiah chapter four, verse one. Now it came about that when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, Sanballat was the governor of Samaria to the north, heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. Sanballat did, it was in his best interest for Jerusalem to remain weak. He didn't want walls around the city because if walls around the city uh, took place and Jerusalem became strong, that would weaken his political power and would probably weaken his ability to make money. So he had a personal agenda there. He became furious and mocked the Jews. And he spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Ha! Now, Tobiah, the Ammonite, the Ammonites were the enemies to the east of Jerusalem. Now, Tobiah, the Ammonite, was near him, and he said, even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, he would break their stone wall down. Nehemiah says, Hear, O our God, how we are despised. Return their reproach on our own heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. Do not forgive their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before thee, for they have demoralized the builders. Battle fatigue, discouragement, they're demoralized, they've been insulted. It's awful. And their strength is failing, and they're feeling like they're unable, and they want to quit. 
Battle fatigue comes when we listen to the lies. Now, what was coming at Israel and the people of God doing this great work, what was coming at them was ridicule by people that didn't want to see the work of God take place. What Nehemiah was led to do was so critical and so strategic and so important. Now, we look at it and we think a wall around the city, that doesn't sound too spiritual. I mean, teaching Bible studies, that sounds a whole lot more spiritual than building a wall, but building the wall was very strategic and very important and very spiritual. It was a God work. And the enemies surrounding Jerusalem didn't want it built, and so they began to ridicule. Now, I think it was Thomas Carlyle who said this, ridicule is the language of the devil. That's how the devil speaks. He speaks in ridicule and mockery. He, he tries to make fun of the Christian who wants to walk with God. He makes fun of the, of the young man, the young woman who says, uh, true love waits and I'm not going to have sex until I get married. And he, he will bring people to mock and ridicule and make fun of a person who has that commitment. And you know, some people can stand bravely against bullets, but they collapse in the face of laughter. And they can't take it when people laugh at them. And all those barbs that were coming their way, all the things that Sanballat and Tobiah were saying, they were lies. It was ridicule and it was a lie. But it, it sounded like, well, maybe, maybe they're right. Uh, I, guess, I guess we can't do this. I guess we are. Uh, this is just a pipe dream. I guess this is just a crummy wall. And if a fox jumped on it, uh, God forbid, it would all, all fall down. And, and so the people began to believe that. Listen, your b battle fatigue and your discouragement and your desire to want to quit will really ramp up when you start listening to lies. You cannot allow yourself to do that. Hey, the way to overcome the battle fatigue that comes from listening to lies is to overcome it with the truth. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth shall set you free. David said in Psalm 15 that the righteous man speaks truth in his heart. And our world is filled with lies and so we have to constantly come back to the Word of God to hear the truth of God in our hearts because it builds us up and it strengthens us and it helps us to see what is the real story here, what is the real situation. You overcome the, truth, the, the lies with the truth. Jesus said in John chapter 4, take care what you listen to. Take care what you listen to. What are you listening to? You listening to the truth? You know, lots of times we, we don't take care what we listen to, and we listen to things on the television, on the radio, and on your iPad or whatever. You listen to things that cause you to fear, that cause you problems, that cause you to wonder. Uh, when I was in college, I had a friend of mine, he worked at Getty Oil Company for a summer job, and he said that he had a guy that worked in the cubicle next to him. And he was listening to country and western music and a particular song that says, and still you wonder who's cheating who, who's being true, who don't even care anymore, who's going right with some folks tonight, whose car's parked next door. You, some of you remember that song. Larry Sims, that's one of his favorites. And, and so <laughs> he was listening to that song. I'm not making this up. He's listening to that song and he's like, you know, I wonder who's parked next door. And when I'm at work, what's my wife doing? It caused him all kinds of angst because he started to wonder about his wife to see whose car was parked next door. Take care of what you listen to and take care who you hang out with. Because if you hang out with people who are negative, who are faithless, who always point out uh, that the glass is half empty and it has a crack in it and there might be some glass chips in there. Stay away from that. If you hang out with folks like that, you pick that up and you start seeing life as, well, yeah, this is negative. This probably won't work. You know, the, the 12 spies that went into the land to spy out the land, 10 of them were negative. Only two of them had faith, Caleb and Joshua. The 10 spies came back and said, well, it's a good land, but we can't go in that land because there are giants in that land. 
Joshua and Caleb said, hey, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. God will be with us, and we can go. Listen, in your circle of friends, you better have some Joshua's and some Caleb's in there. If all you hang out are, uh, are with uh, the ten faithless spies, you're in trouble because bad company corrupts good morals, and he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools suffers harm. Battle fatigue comes when we listen to lies. Secondly, battle fatigue comes when we lose our strength. Verse 6, so we built a wall, and the whole wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. They were at the halfway point. Now, it came about when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on and that the breaches began to be closed, they were very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance in it. Verse 9 says, But we prayed to our God, and because of them we set up a guard against them day and night. Thus in Judah it was said, The strength of the burden bearers is failing Yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. They had lost their strength. Their strength was failing. They were at the halfway point. Now, you know, when you, as I mentioned, you're climbing the mountain, and you get to the halfway point, and there's so much mountain left that you just, ah, can't do this anymore. It's like, as I've read, never experienced this personally, those that try and run a marathon, you know, they always talk about, hey, when you run a marathon, you're going to hit a point where you hit the wall, and you got to push through. Well, these guys building the wall had hit the wall, and they got to the halfway point, and they said, we can't do this anymore. I like what it says in the Message Bible for Nehemiah 4.10, but soon word was going around in Judah, the builders are pooped, the rubbish piles up, we're in over our heads, we can't build this wall. Battle fatigue comes when you just get physically exhausted. You, you just, you can't see things clearly anymore. You're just so tired that it just seems overwhelming. Now, the way to overcome losing your strength, you overcome it with physical rest. You have to rest your body. You have to rest your mind. You, you weren't made. I wasn't made to go, 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 go all the time. It was Vince Lombardi, the great football coach of the Green Bay Packers, who said fatigue makes cowards of us all when you just get so tired. Jesus said to the disciples when they were ministering and they were winning people to the Lord, he said in Mark chapter 6, verse 31, but so many people were coming and going that Jesus and the apostles did not even have a chance to eat. Then Jesus said, let us go to a place where we can be alone and get some rest. And there are needs everywhere. They couldn't even eat. The people were coming and coming and coming. And Jesus said, hey, we need to take some time for some R&R. &R. Let's go to a lonely place and rest a while. Why? Because you guys need it. And we need it. And Jesus in his humanity, he needed it. He couldn't go 24-7. We weren't built for that. You know, in the Ten Commandments, resting on the Sabbath is one of the commandments. Six days shalt thou labor, but the seventh day you shall rest. And many of us don't heed that command. And we go, go, go. And when you go, 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 you run down, run down, run down, run down, and then fatigue makes cowards of us all. There's a Greek proverb that says, if you, you will break the bow if you keep it always bent. If your bow has always got tension on it, if there's always stress on it, you're going to break the bow. So here's the question. In your life, how tight is your bow? Do you have times where there's just downtime? Do you have times where you have margins? If you don't, battle fatigue will come in. And it also, not only with physical rest, but it's overcome with reliance on God. See, when we rest our bodies, as the Lord says to do, we are to six days shall you labor. The seventh is a, is a Sabbath unto the Lord, and you're going to rest and cease from your labor. On the seventh day, you're not only to rest your body, but you're to recharge your spirit. 
and you're to fill up. And that's why uh, we, we meet on uh, one day a week to really recharge. We come together as a church in a big group to recharge and to be encouraged and to sing the praises and to hear from the Lord. That's important. Scripture says in Isaiah 40, 29, he gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Battle fatigue. It comes when we listen to lies. It comes when we lose our strength. Thirdly, battle fatigue comes when we lose our focus. Verse 10. Thus in Judah it was said the strength of the burden bearers is failing, yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said they will not know or see until we come among them, kill them, and put a stop to the work. And it came about when the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times, they will come up against us from every place where you may turn. Then I stationed men in the lowest parts of the space between the wall, the exposed places, and I stationed the people in families with their swords, spears, and bows. It comes when you lose your focus. Battle fatigue. Now, the enemies, Sanballat, Tobiah, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites, the enemies all around Jerusalem that didn't want the wall up, they were saying, we're going to come at you. We're going to attack you. We're going to kill you. They told them that 10 times. And it was one of those things where it's like, man, we're, we're doing something. It's so hard, and there's so much opposition. And, uh, you know, when I signed up for this, Nehemiah, when, you know, when I said, yeah, I'll do it, I signed up. You gave me a T-shirt. You know, we're part of the wall builders, and I was really excited. But now I'm, I'm looking at dying, and I don't know if I'm ready to do that. I mean, they said they're coming, and, man, I, I, th I think I better quit. It's too hard. We're unable that happens to us. And it happens because we lose our focus. And, and, and our eyes were on the Lord when we started, but then they get on other things, and especially on the scary things. And we look at this enemy, and we hear these voices, and, and you know, at, at any moment, they're going to come and attack you. Nehemiah said in verse 14, when I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. One of my favorite verses in the Old Testament, Nehemiah 4:14. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight. And fight. Hey, why do we get battle fatigue? Why do we get so discouraged? Because we lose our focus. We get our eyes off the Lord. We forget that he is great and awesome. The way you overcome that kind of battle fatigue is to remember the Lord, to recount and put him first and foremost in your mind. You remember who he is. You remember what he has said. You remember what he has done. You remember who has commissioned you. That's why I said earlier in this service, regardless of who becomes president of the United States of America, my God is in charge. He sits on his throne. Jesus Christ is king of kings and lord of lords. The Lord sat as king at the flood. Yes, the Lord sits as king forever. We need to remember that. Listen, I'm convinced that it's important for a Christian to know what's going on. We need to be abreast of the news. And let's face it, uh, mainstream media, they, they don't tell you the news the way it really is. Everything is slanted. And so you got to find some kind of news source that's going to give you the real picture that doesn't have an agenda. But if all you do is listen to news, 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 you get to be pretty jaded about life. You start to think, man, I need to go uh, live under a rock somewhere and check out and, you know, just build a bunker and get a bunch of ammunition and guns and, and just protect my family. And it can make you uh, just afraid. We don't need to live like that. We don't need to be like that. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight. 
And how do we fight as Christians? We fight on our knees. We don't fight with our hands. We fight on our knees as we pray. We fight as we stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. Now, we know in the Bible that when you step out to do something for the Lord, that your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He's going to come at you, and what is the language of the devil? It's ridicule. It's threats. It's it's to try and get you afraid so you back up and quit. You know, when Peter got out of the boat, he wanted to walk on the water with Jesus. Lord, if it's really you, bid me come to you on the water. And Jesus had come, and Peter got out of the boat, and he walked on the water to Jesus. And the Scripture says everything was going good until seeing the wind. He became afraid. It was a stormy night. No doubt an unkind wave slapped him in the face. And seeing the wind, he became afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? I'll tell you why he doubted. Because he took his eyes off the Lord. You take your eyes off the Lord and you look at your enemy and you look at your surroundings and you focus in on those and you forget the Lord who is great and awesome. You're going to fear And you're going to want to leave your post, and you're going to want to say, this is too hard. Hey, remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight. You don't quit. You don't leave. You fight. You stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. David, when he fought Goliath, he's just a kid, just a teenager, peach fuzz on his chin. And he fought Goliath, and what did he have? He had a sling and a stick and a pouch with five smooth stones. That's all he had. He went up against nine-foot, nine-inch Goliath. No one on Israel's side wanted to face off with that guy. And when David stepped out on the battlefield, Goliath saw him and he disdained him because he was a youth. And Goliath, who is a picture of the devil, he says, "Uh, who is this, this shepherd kid that's coming to me? He says, come to me, little boy. I'll break you up in pieces and feed you to the pigeons. And he cursed David by his gods. And that's a picture of the devil wanting to get us to say, oh, no, this, I shouldn't have done this. I should have never gotten on the battlefield. I, I need to leave now. I'll run, hide under the tent. David didn't do that. David remembered the Lord who is great and awesome, and he fought. You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have taunted. He says, this day, the Lord is going to deliver you into my hand, and I'm going to cut off your head, big boy, and we're going to feed the the bodies of the armies of the Philistines to the beasts of the field and the birds of the air so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Remember the Lord because he's great and he's awesome. That word means terrifying. Our God is a consuming fire. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We need to remember that God is that kind of God. He's the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, the God of angel armies. And he is undefeated. He is the all-time undefeated heavyweight champion of the universe, and he will never be defeated. And all we need to do is line up with him, and he will see us through. Hey, it's overcome by remembering the Lord. And then lastly, battle fatigue comes when we lose our value in the mission. We lose our value. You know, they came at the people, and Nehemiah had them fight, and he stationed people, and they were ready, and they were there, and the enemy never came. Ten times they said, we're going to come after you. You're not going to be ready and aware, and we're just going to come after you. They never came. But the enemy didn't give up. And in chapter 6, the enemy comes again at Nehemiah. And it says in verse 1, Now it came about when it was reported to Sanballat, Tobiah, to Geshem, the Arab, and to the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and that no breach remained in it, although all at that time I had not set up the doors in the gates. The wall is completed, but the gates aren't in. And so the project is still uh, under completion. It says in verse 2 that Sanballat and Geshem sent a message to me saying, Come and let us meet together at in the care of him in the plains of Ono, but they were planning to harm me. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work 
and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent messages to me four times in this manner, and I answered them in the same way. Come down to the plains of Ono. And Nehemiah said, oh, no. To oh, no, I'm not coming there. They're planning to harm me. And I love what he says in verse 3. I am doing a great work. How can I leave the work to come down to you? Hey, when do we get battle fatigue? When do we get so discouraged? It's when you start thinking what you're doing doesn't matter, doesn't have value, doesn't make a significance. And it would have been easy for the people who were building the wall with Nehemiah to look around at Jerusalem. It wasn't the same Jerusalem. Solomon's temple had been burned and destroyed and they rebuilt the temple under Zerubbabel, but that temple wasn't anything like Solomon's temple. That was a second-rate temple. Here we are and we're building and there's a second-rate temple. The city's just not the same. The, the wall is not as good as it used to be. Nothing's as good, everything. It's just crummy. It's just junk. Ah, oh, that's where the devil wants you. He wants to get you to think what you're doing doesn't matter and it's just crummy and it's just second rate and it's just junk. Let me tell you something. If you are walking with God and you are where God wants you to be in your life, in your family, in your job, you are doing a great work for the Lord because that's what he has called you to do. As I said, building a wall is not super spiritual, but it was super important and it's what God wanted them to do. We, we sometimes think, well, you know, what I'm doing doesn't matter. Yeah, Jeff, I got a dead-end job, and, and, you know, I just don't like what I'm doing. And so, it, it, you know, God, God can't be in this because it's such a dead-end job. If God has placed you there, then shine and share where you are. Bloom where you're planted. You're doing a great work for the Lord to be his salt and his light. Listen, some of you, especially you moms, young moms, whether you work outside the home or whether you stay a uh, stay-at-home mom, I believe with all my heart that the hardest job on the planet is being a mom. Anybody else believe that? It's a hard job to be a mom. Man, it is so, kids tend not to be very appreciative of mom when they're little and you wear yourself out and you're changing dirty diapers and you're cleaning the kitchen and you're doing laundry and it's over and over and over again. And you just think, what am I doing here? Let me tell you what you're doing here, Mom. You're doing a great work. You're doing a great work because you're raising up boys and girls who will know the Lord and love the Lord and walk with the Lord. You're doing a great work. You need to remind yourself of that. That's a great work. And God is pleased with you as you do that work. The story is told about Sir Christopher Wren Sir Christopher Wren, the architect who built St. Paul's Cathedral in the late 1600s, early 1700s. And the story goes this way. Sir Christopher Wren was walking on the job site and uh, talking to some of the workers. They didn't know who he was. He was kind of incognito to these guys, the, the guys that were doing the more manual labor jobs. And he went to the first guy, and he says to him, the laborer, what are you doing? He says, I'm cutting stone. I get five shillings a day. Went to the second guy. He's on a wheelbarrow. He said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm hauling off the debris and stuff like that. I, they pay me five shillings a day. He went to the third guy doing a menial labor job. He said, what are you doing, sir? He said, I am working with Sir Christopher Wren to build a cathedral to the glory of God. That's what I'm doing. See, he saw that what he was doing was a great work. And you need to see what you're doing, whatever it might be. That's a great work. You know, we have people right now in our church who are taking care of little ones so that we can be in here. And they can think, you know, how many times do I have to change diapers? How many times do I have to wipe runny noses? I mean, how is this spiritual? Hey, what they're doing is a great work. It's a great work because it allows others to hear the gospel and to know that their kids are being taken care of. Battle fatigue comes and discouragement comes and wanting to quit comes when you lose your value in the mission. So it's overcome by seeing that you're doing a great work and it's overcome by working together. We need one another and in Nehemiah's day, they needed one another. And chapter four goes on to say this in verse 16. 
and it came about from that day on that half of my servants carried on the work while half of them held the spears, the shields, the bows, and the breastplates, and the captains were behind the whole house of Judah. They worked together. Those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon. As for the builders, each wore his sword girded at his side as he built while the trumpeter stood near me. And I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. At whatever place you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. They began to pull together and work together. How do you combat the idea that what you're doing doesn't matter? You begin to work together with others. You begin to see that we were made for one another. That's why church attendance is so important and church participation and church involvement is so important because in church, you encourage one another, you love one another, you spur one another on to love and good deeds. We're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some, but we're to do it all the more, come together all the more as we see the day approaching. And I believe the day is approaching of Christ's return. Battle fatigue. You experiencing some battle fatigue? Heard a true story about a man named Mr. Darby. Mr. Darby lived during the days of the gold rush. He had an uncle who was in Colorado who went there to, to find gold and he began to mine and excavate and he found some gold and he reported back to his nephew. He said, hey, get some mach machinery and let's come and let's, let's find our fortune in gold. I found a small little vein in this, in this cave and so we can dig out this and we can make good money, but I need more equipment. And so his nephew, he came and he helped his uncle and they began to dig and they found some gold and they found enough gold to, to keep them going and to keep them excited. But then as they were excavating and digging, the gold vein dried up, and they dug and dug and dug nothing, and they dug and dug and dug nothing, and dug and dug and dug more and more and more nothing, and they were just amassing debt, and so they just decided, let's just quit. There's nothing else for us. We, we need to cut our losses, and so they sold their equipment to a junk dealer, and the junk dealer bought it for pennies on the dollar. He bought that equipment. They left the junk dealer before he took the equipment and just sold it for parts. He had somebody come in and check the mine, an expert come in and look at the mine. And the expert says, there's still gold in here. And he began to dig. And no lie, three feet from where Darby and his uncle had quit digging, he found gold. And that man made millions of dollars. What's the point of that story? Some of you are here and you're ready to quit because the going has gotten tough and you're getting afraid because all the things are coming against you and you're so worn out and you're so discouraged and the strength of the burden bearers is failing and you want to quit. Don't quit. Keep going. Victory comes to those who refuse to quit. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. Don't quit. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Trust God no matter what. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight. Listen, in order to win the spiritual battle, you must have power within. And that power only comes from the Lord. So here's the big question. Does the Lord live in your life? Has there ever been a time when you've truly surrendered your heart to him? Now, if not, that can happen today with this simple prayer. Just say from your heart, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross and rose again on the third day. And right now, Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, to come into my heart, to be my Lord and Savior. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching. 
to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please call that toll-free number. Take the time to let me know what's going on. Hey, you really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about the plan when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.